have that kind of Christian fellowship. My, my. All right. The, um, we'll start tonight with uh, the Bride of Christ. And we'll get into uh, something that's definitely closely related. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 14. 1 Timothy 2.14. The Bible says in verse 13, Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she should be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Father, bless this book the understanding and wisdom in it. I need the gift of teaching tonight, Father. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now we know that Adam, first Adam, is a type of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so many things we can learn from Adam and from Eve. As the apostle here tells us in 1 Timothy, he says that Adam was first formed, said Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so even though she had sinned, Adam chose to die with her. And this is a choice that he made because by doing this, then uh, God would not form another woman or create anything else. And therefore, he took his place with the woman. And that ended God's relationship, or let's put it this way, didn't end it. It simply changed it uh, the way he dealt with humanity. Did any of this take God off guard? No. Was any of this... Uh, was any of this uh, uh, something that, uh, that he had to react to. No, 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 no. He knows all things, and he has a reason for us being here in this world, and one day we'll see him, we'll see him, we'll see him face to face. Amen. But the Bible said the woman was deceived. Now Eve's a type of Christ. I mean, uh, Adam's a type of Christ, and Eve's a type of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and verse number 7, it says this, 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Now this is the Apostle Paul who, of course, receives an awful lot of criticism and condemnation and say that he was, uh, as they use the term today, misogynistic which is a bunch of garbage. They create terms, identify people with them, and demonize them with them. Uh, how many's ever heard of a MAGA Republican? You hear this now all the time. MAGA, MAGA, MAGA. They wear it out. And of course they do because they demonize you if you are identified as a MAGA Republican. I identify tonight as a Christian, folks. My Lord Jesus Christ is what matters to me. And uh, if I hope the Republican aligns himself with that, but if he doesn't, I'm not of him at all. I'm of Christ. I belong to the Lord Jesus. But in First Christ, uh, chapter number 11, verse number 7, the Bible says the, the woman is the glory of the man. Now I'll say, what does this mean? It means that the woman, Eve, being a type of the bride of Christ, is glory, is glory to the man, just like we today as the bride of Christ that he is presenting himself and to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We are the glory to Christ, or he glorifies or glories in us as the bride of Christ, being the church of the firstborn. In the book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12, it says in Romans 5, 12, it's important to read this because it helps you get an understanding of how this book is put together. Whereby, as by... Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Therefore, the curse that has come upon mankind did not come through the woman. The curse came through the man. Therefore, he passed his seed from generation to generation, and by that he passed the curse from generation to generation. And this is what the apostle is telling us in the book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12. The curse is passed by the man, 
The Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14 that a virgin shall conceive, a virgin, and bring forth a son. And uh, this virgin is said in Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 31 is to be bearing the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be virgin born. Therefore, he is born against all the laws of nature. But he didn't come naturally. He came supernaturally. He came by direct act of God. So the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 and verse number 7 that the spirit of the man or the woman comes from God. The spirit of the man or the woman comes from God. Now I say, why are you giving us all this tonight? I'm giving it to you to start to put some things together for you. The Bible is not a boring book. It's not, folks. The fact of the matter is the Bible's head and shoulders above every one of us tonight. And if we'd pray, God would open the book to us. And you'd be amazed at how things begin to open up to your soul as you begin to receive the scripture. The spirit of the man, ruach in Hebrew, nefesh in Hebrew is his soul. But ruach, the spirit of the man or the woman, comes from God. That means every last one of us tonight, our spirit came from God. God does not send forth cursed spirits. The curse came through the man, came through the seed. He that is born of woman, man that is born of woman, is a few days and full of troubles. The virgin birth was, uh, therefore the virgin was born as all women by receiving the curse from their father. They cannot pass it on. That is done by the father. Why is that important? Because the Lord Jesus Christ being virgin born could not receive the curse from his mother Mary. A lot of people have asked the question, how could the Lord Jesus Christ, who was sinless and perfect, be born of a sinful woman or a sinner? She was either a sinner or she was perfect. Now, this is the Catholic doctrine of immaculate conception. They teach that she was sinless and that the Lord Jesus Christ was born of her sinless. I don't believe that. I do not believe that at all. She was born like every other person, but keep in mind, the seed of the man is where the curse comes, okay? Her spirit, her soul did not come from a curse. And remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be born of a virgin. So, so where did the virgin come from? Where did this virgin, where, where did the Eve come from in the Old Testament? She came from a rib. God took a rib. He took one of Adam's ribs, a bone, and uh, she didn't come from the seed of a man. Eve did not. No man was involved. No seed was involved. She was not born. Remember, she was created or she was made from the bone of a man. She did not come from the ground. Adam's body came from the ground, but not hers. She came as a direct act of God. God personally intervened in the creation of Eve by taking a bone from Adam's side. She came from the man. She came from the man, not from the ground, not from anywhere else, but from the man. Therefore, he called their name Adam. Adam is a generic term. The so Hebrew word simply means mankind. So he called them, Adam and Eve, mankind. I know that's not, uh, I know they don't like that today, any terminology like that, but it's making a difference what they like. Mankind is the terminology. Each after its own kind, it says in the book of Genesis, remember? The cattle, the dog, and all the rest of them, after their own kind. Now look at the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ does not come from the seed of man, did it? No. No, no. The bride of Christ does not come from the seed of man. Therefore, it does not come from the transmission of the curse. The bride of Christ does not come from the ground as Adam's body was made. No, no, no. It's not coming from the ground. Where does it come from? It comes from the last Adam. It's coming from him, just like the first one. Yeah. It comes as a direct act of God. Every one of us tonight, if you're born again, you've been placed into the body of Christ. The body of Christ being all of those believers here on this earth. Yeah. The Bible said, for by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. She comes from the man, Christ, <coughs> from his side. 
from his side, from his side. You remember when the Roman soldier put the spear into the side of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Forthwith came what? Blood and water. Blood and water. But here's the thing about it. When he did that, Christ was dead. He wasn't alive. He had already died. Uh, therefore, this represents a place that is close to his heart. And this is where we came from. We came from the very heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. God opened him up, and then he closed him. The rib was taken. Now, if you don't know this, there's something important about a rib. It's an unusual bone in the body. Say, unusual in what sense? A rib can grow again. That is unusual. It can grow and close up the opening like no other bone. A rib can do that. That's quite a thing. When you get home, check that out. So where she was taken, it was closed up. And so we came forth from his heart. When he was dead, the spear went into his side, and forthwith came blood and water. And you understand this, that when a child is born, you have blood and water. Both elements are involved in the birth of a child. Therefore, the bride was brought to Adam after he had been put to sleep. Adam had been put to sleep, and then he was brought back, and this is when God brought his bride to him. This is a type of what happens with the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to sleep on the cross. Look what it says in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. I think Peter is thinking about Christ. He's thinking about Eve and he's thinking about Adam. And not only just thinking, he's inspired of God. God breathed. Notice, theos noustos. God breathed into the man to give him identity and being. Then he breathed into his word to give you the inspired scripture. Breathed of God. God breathed. Theos noustos is the term, see? That's what inspired means. When someone expires, it means that their breath has left their body. I remember when my grandfather passed at UT Hospital, the nurse looked at us and said, he has expired. Now, that's a euphemism. What's that mean? It simply means that without speaking the hard truth that he has died or he has passed, he has expired. He has breathed out his last. So God breathes into the scripture, literally coming forth from the inside of God, the same place you came forth from when he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life and you became a living soul. Adam's soul was from the breath of God. As you know, as I've said to you before, man is the only creature in the Bible whose life came forth from the very breath of God. An angel may breathe if it shows up in a human body, but its life is not breathing. There's not a word in the Bible that says an angel has to breathe to live because they were not created. They were not, God didn't breathe into them. They're created spirit beings who can take on bodily form. So in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now look how Peter says this. Now there's a number of ways to approach this. This could be saying, as some say, well, this simply means that the fact that Christ arose from the dead is surety to us, that he has saved us, and that we are born again by faith in him. Or you can look at this text and read it as if it were saying, look carefully, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto the, a lively hope by or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That would connect it with the typology of Adam when he was put to sleep. Adam was put to sleep, and during the sleep, the rib was taken from his side, and then when he awakened, here comes his bride. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was put to sleep, or he sleeps, his body sleeps, and then when he arose from the dead, he arose from the dead, his, bri his bride, that's us, we're, we were begotten again unto a lively hope 
by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, the Bible says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He was said to be the Son of God time and time again before that. But here's the thing. Death could not hold him because he was the origin of life. And being the origin of life, my friend, that connected him with Almighty God. And when he came forth from the dead, he came forth victor over death, over hell, and over the grave. Think of it like this. It's not so much that he rose from the dead. It is that death fell from him. <laughs> and by falling from him, it couldn't hold him. And by falling from him, it couldn't hold him. Up from the dead, he arose. He broke the chains. What a thing. So... We have been begotten again into a lively hope, as Peter said, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now turn to Proverbs chapter number 3 and verse 5. Proverbs 3, 5. Proverbs 3, 5. In the book of Proverbs, here's what it says in chapter number 3 and verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. Now this is important. It's very important because it tells you that you cannot trust, you cannot trust your heart and your soul and your mind and your brain to be all that is necessary and the foundational thing for you to walk in fellowship with God. There's got to be something greater than that. There's got to be something stronger than your ability. Look how he says it in Psalm 139, verse number 23. Psalm 139, verse number 23. Now listen to David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know what he's saying? He says, I do not want to be given over to self-delusion. I want to walk with you, Lord, but I don't trust myself to know what's necessary, what's inside me. Lord, please search my heart. Try my reins. Nothing's higher than that because he puts his trust in the Lord completely. All sin comes from a common source. You don't have a source of sin here and a source of sin there and a source of sin here. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, a lot of times you'll hear that quoted, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. My friend, that's not what he said. The sins of the world is not the issue. The sin of the world is the issue. He said, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He'll not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, he'll speak of me. And he will convince the world of sin. Sin. Not of adultery. Not fornication, not thievery, not lying murder. He'll convince the world of sin, the sin, the greatest sin, the sin that is above all sins. And that's what's going on here. And we'll get into that in a moment. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. A lot of people say, well, how John the Baptist, I mean, how in the world could he get into this kind of high theology talking about taking away the sin of the world? You know, I mean, John the Baptist was, had been living out there in the wilderness of Judea, <laughs> and wearing uh, uh, camel's hair and, and eating wild locusts and honey and so forth. So how did he know something like that? That's not the issue. No. He's inspired of God to write what he writes. Oh, and the wisdom of God comes to him. This is what's important yeah. about it. It's, it's not of human origin. This is what's important. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They didn't speak yeah. as they felt about something. The Holy Spirit moved them. And they wrote the scripture. So what hap what's happening? Well, it is... It's, it's a comes from a common source because sin by its essence and by its nature is a spiritual thing. Yeah. It's a spiritual thing, but it manifests itself in physical things. Sin manifests itself in physical things. If you see someone murder someone, what have you got? You've got sin. He's a murderer. But why did he do it and where did it come from? You see, Satan would have you, and Satan's very clever. Satan would have you fight your sins. He would have you dealing all the time with trying to figure out how you're going to overcome your sins. I mean, what, what, what fellowship can I have? What, what, what meditation can I get into? What can I do here to overcome my sins? Your sins are not the problem. 
The problem is that you do not walk in fellowship with God and let the Holy Ghost begin to show you the reason for why you did what you did. Do you realize that a man can murder someone? Another person can murder someone. Both of them are murderers, but for two entirely different reasons. Not that they have something physical as a reason, but the origin of it from the inside. They're all connected. Sin is sin. Now, I understand there are varying degrees of it. I certainly understand all that. We know that. Sin unto death, sending away the day of grace, unpardonable sin. And, but these, the issue I'm trying to get across to you tonight is so important. This is so very important. Because here's the way men work and here's the way they think. Well, I'll search my heart. Oh, man, there's a little greed in there. I need to get rid of that. Oh, uh, yeah, and there's a little lust in here. I need to get rid of that lust. And I'm short-tempered, you know, and I'm not showing the kind of love I should show to people. And, you know, every once in a while I might try to stretch the truth a little bit. And so I, I need help with these things, Lord. And so, and so I, I need to get all this together and get it taken care of. That's not your problem. Your problem is deep, deep, deep down inside your soul, and there's only one that can help you with that. That's the one that can speak deep, deep, deep down inside the soul. Stopping the physical manifestation of sin doesn't cure the problem. The same problem may manifest itself in many other ways. In other words, stopping the act does not fix, fix the problem. You may have committed some obvious sin, but the Spirit of God moves in your soul. Now listen to me. Now these things I'm reading to you in a period of probably 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I just sat down. And God began to move my hand to write these things out. And I'm giving you tonight what he gave me. You may have committed some obvious sin, but the Spirit of God moves in your soul to bring you to the place of confronting the reason for the obvious sin. Two people can commit the very same sin together, but for entirely different reasons. They can be, both be bank robbers, but for entirely different reasons. Victory over sin is not won by focusing on the sins. For example, I'll beat the rebellion out of you. You ever heard a dad say that? You ever had that said to you? You ever had someone take a club to you, stick to you, belt? I grew up in a time when I did, folks. I'm telling you the truth tonight. I grew up in a time when a parent would grab their child up by the arm and you'd see them frailing away right there in public. I've seen them do that on KTL buses right here in Knoxville. I whip them right there in public and you dare not step in. <laughs> and there, wasn't, there was none of this child abuse stuff back then. And, ch and children were abused, no question about that. But in those days, parents had far more authority and did not have to fear the government like they do today. Amen. They did not. And I understand their abuses. I realize that. I, am, I certainly understand all that. Uh, there's nothing that, that enrages me more to see a baby with, with, with uh, bruises on it, to know the child has been uh, abused. No, I, can't, I have no use for that. No. So uh, victory over sins is not won by focusing on the sins. Victory comes by fellowship and communion with a son, the answer for all things. And people don't like that. They really don't. They think, well, if I prayed, that's good enough. No, that's not. It's good that you pray. But what is communion? Communion is talking to God and then listening to him. Listening to him. Do you understand that he can begin to move in your soul and show you what's really deep down inside your soul that you didn't even know was there? And by dealing with that and confessing that before God, a lot of this stuff that you're doing just kind of dries up. Why? Because you went to the root of the matter. You went to what needed to be done. His word, which represents him, will not be mocked. God is not mocked. The Bible talks about the time when he will be judged. He's not mocked. So what does that mean? It means that there is a holiness of God. God is holy. And he's a sovereign God. And he sent forth that holiness and that spirit into this world. And by sending it forth, he says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's that mean? Sin is like a cancer. Once you allow it to begin to work on you, it may manifest itself in a lot of different ways. 
but it's still going to work on you and it's not going to stop working on you until it eats you up. It's going to consume you. It is literally going to take you from this earth. And do you know you can't stop it? It is incurable except for one. The Lord Jesus Christ can stop it and the blood of Christ can cleanse it. But it, the only way that's going to work in your life is for you to desire to have fellowship with the Lord. What's that? Listen to him. I got mad today. And you got a temper preacher? Yeah, I got one. And uh, I wish I didn't have it sometimes. It got me in trouble more than once. Uh, but I did. I, I did my thing. <laughs> this girl pulled in front of me, and I mean, she nearly ran me off the road. And I said to myself, I didn't say <laughs> I thought to myself, now you going to like this. What's going on here? And, uh, and, you know, I strutted around, him hauled around for a while, and then the Holy Ghost <laughs> began to work on my soul. <laughs> I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Now, you know why I said that? Because I lost that, that feel, that joy, that, that movement of the Holy Ghost. How many know what I'm talking about? There's, there's a freedom. There's, there's a joy in there. There's, there's something inside you that lets you know, I know the Lord, and I know I'm talking to him. He's talking to me, and I don't lose that, and this is not worth it. <laughs> so I confessed it. You know what happened? Joy came back. Just like that. Just like that. Came back. Yeah. You can get up here and preach till you turn blue in the face, stomp and sweat and carry on for 50 years, and you can still sin. All you preachers need to understand that, <laughs> A lot of them have the idea because they preach that God gives them special freedom and liberty. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Your sin will find you out. So listen to this. To receive instruction and communion with God is to receive the working of the Holy Spirit in you. And I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't have to tell you tonight who the Holy Spirit is. That's the one who came into you when you got saved. And he came into your life and a lot of times it takes a little while to really get a hold of the fact somebody's moved in. That's right. And you can't just get away with the kind of life you lived before. Something's going on inside me. I just don't, I, I just can't run with the hounds any longer. Something's eating on me that doesn't bother them. That's the Holy Ghost. To receive instruction, communion with God is to receive the working of the Holy Spirit in you. Whether you understand or not changes nothing. The Spirit does His work. You will find your sense of confession greatly improved. So what does that mean? That means when you first get saved, you have a, most of, most, a, a, a young convert in Christ, a babe in Christ, most of their concept of sin is very superficial. Okay? Do this, don't do that, I did this, I said that, I did this, 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 this. But they can't go deep into it. Okay? So their confession is superficial. And that's the way it goes. And a lot of preaching is superficial. And that doesn't do you any good whatsoever. Do you realize that God's Holy Spirit can be working on you in ways that you never imagined? And you may think you've committed some sin, you've confessed it, but that's not what God's interested in. He's interested in something a whole lot deeper than what you, it's good you confess it. It's good I confess what I did today. It's good that you confess it. But God is interested in something a whole lot more uh, has more and more substance to it. And you may not understand what he's doing and how he's doing it, but he's doing it. But here's the thing. You will begin to understand when things begin to change in your life and your perception of right and wrong and holiness and goodness and the righteousness of God and the love of God and the love that wells up inside your soul and the fact that you want to be with him and you want to talk to him and you want to pray and you want to serve him. That begins to grow. Well, I'm going to tell you what did that. The Holy Ghost did that. You can't do that. When it says grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, that's, what, that's the work of God. A lot of people think, well, I fill my head full of knowledge. I've been to Bible college and all that. I'm growing in the Lord. No, you're just growing. Your head's pumped up. Your head's swelled up. That's right. There's nothing wrong with learning these things, but that doesn't make you spiritual, and that doesn't mature you. No, no, no. What makes you spiritual is sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And allow him to work in your heart. And what matures you is the battles that you fight on this earth. The things that you endure. What you go through. 
And the more you learn of God, and the more you realize he's with you, and he's with you in ways you never, you never imagined, but he's with you. He won't forsake you. He can't forsake you. He can't do it. But anyway, this is what I'm trying to say to you tonight. It's not cut and dried. You don't turn him on and turn him off. It doesn't work that way. A lot of people think, well, now, Lord, I'm going to put you on for a while here Sunday, and I'll hang you up when I need you next time I'll call you. No, it doesn't work that way either. No, no, no. He's not something to be put on and taken off. He's God. So what is the ultimate sin? So what is it? I mean, what, when he said he, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, what would you think the ultimate sin would be tonight? It takes away the sin of the world, not the sins. To believe is to accept or say yes to the person of God. That's right. It's to the person of God. If you can't see God in the Bible, that's because you don't have the Holy Ghost open in your soul. You let the Holy Spirit come into your soul, he'll open up that book, and it'll be Christ from cover to cover. He'll be there. So he came to, he, to the believe is to accept or say yes to the person of God. Now watch this. To not believe is to, in essence, say to God, you're a liar. Where's that in the Bible? Turn to 1 John 5. Verse 10. In 1 John chapter number 5 and verse 10. He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. What's that? It's the Holy Ghost. He that believeth not God. Notice how personal this is. He didn't say that he that believeth not the Scriptures. Notice how God is connected with his Word. See, they're inseparable. God and his Word are inseparable. They're together. Why? Because it is. The Word was God. Now look at this. He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God, now look at this, hath made him a what? A liar. A liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Now, let's say you've, you, you know, you've, you've got problems. Let's say you've you know, you're drunk or whatever, all kinds of stuff. Lord knows, man, we, there's a litany of sins. But when you begin to think about, well, the Bible said he that committed, what was it, uh, fornication, sinneth against his own soul. Where does that say that? Something like that. Adultery or something. Sinneth against his own soul, okay? But folks, this is talking about personally, against God, sinning against God personally, attacking God's character, and it doesn't get any worse than that. And the Bible says, if you don't believe the record that he gave of his son, and that's the record here, you're calling God a liar. And did you know that John, 1 John, uses that word liar over and over and over and over again, and that's a different message altogether, but it's quite a revealing thing of where and why John uses the term liar. You know what he says in 1 John? He says, if you say you have not sinned, what does it say there? You're making God a liar. John uses strong terms. So what do you mean? It becomes personal. He that says a word against the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, against the Son of Man, it says in Matthew, you say a word against the Son of Man, he can be forgiven. Right. But you speak a word against the Holy Ghost, and there's neither forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. Right. What are you talking about? Well, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? He's to point you to Christ. Right. He's to point you to God. He's to work upon your heart. Oh, now look at this. You're calling God a liar, God's character, his reputation, his holiness is all bound up in his word. To reject his word is indeed calling him a liar, which is a direct sin against God. His word represents his honor, character, holiness, reputation. If you in 1 John 5 believe not God, then you call him a liar. Now I'm going to finish up with this page and listen carefully. He took away the sin of the world. The essence of sin he became. The Bible said he became sin for us who knew no sin. It didn't say he became a sinner. And it didn't say he became the sin offering. 
Now, you can get into 15 or 20 different commentaries, good commentaries, good men, and they'll disagree like you wouldn't believe. I do not believe sin offering. I do not believe sinner. He became the essence of sin. That's what I believe, first, that when Christ died. The essence of sin is not made clear. Why? Because it's a spiritual thing. And there will always be a mystery attached to anything spiritual. Just like you as a man or a woman, all right? You're made in the image of God. That means that there's a mystery attached to you. That will always be a mystery until he reveals that mystery. There's a mystery of God. It says in the book of Revelation, one day will be revealed. All right, now look. But we can see a pattern. Christ became sin to take it away. He was the propitiation, it says in 1 John. What's that mean? The appeasement. Now, when you go back and look at any history, you'll find that Moloch and all the rest of the Carthaginians, when they had, when they had their gods, it was human sacrifice. But what was the point of the human sacrifice? It was to appease their angry God. That's what it was about. Their God was angry, so they offered up their children to appease him or her to make them acceptable so their crops would grow and this and that and so forth and so on. Well, the Bible says that Christ was the propitiation for our sins, the appeasement. Man has a guilt complex. Man knows he's a sinner. I don't care how pagan he is and how dark the world he lives in. He knows that. He knows it. And he tries to do something about it. But he can't do anything about it because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. What about pagan gods and all the rest of it? They can't do anything. They can't give them peace. But the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied the anger and righteousness of God. And, God, and Christ reconciled through Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ brought all of mankind and humanity Back to God. Now he did that. He did that. Christ did that. God the Father waited and the Son presented. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that could bring us back to God. As the old timers used to say, he took man in one hand and he took God in the other. And there's the connection, the bridge between the two. And it is. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Because of his manhood, he earned the right to sit at the right hand of the Father and please our, plead, our, and plead our case. So therefore, to refuse to accept Christ is to call God a liar. How's that so? Because it's a personal sin against God and the record that God gave of his son in the Bible, John said, these things are written that you might believe. The apostle John says, if you deny that Christ came in the flesh, you are an antichrist. He doesn't leave any, any wiggle room. So, when a person is an unbeliever, it's not that they have just chosen, you know, to refuse and not believe this and for whatever reason, I'm not going to believe the gospel or what have you. No. According to the scripture, you, by rejecting Christ and what the Bible says about him, are calling God a liar. And that gets very personal. And that's very powerful. That's very powerful. You see, the unbeliever is in rebellion against God. And so the sin, the ultimate sin of all sins that I would understand it to be, would be when a man places himself before God and says to him, I don't believe anything you've said. I don't believe anything about who Christ was, that I will make my own decisions and let my mind be my God, and I will judge my life, and I'll live a good life and a good moral life, and I'll be okay when I die. That, my dear friend, is the faith of a fool. That's the faith of a fool. You believe when the Lord Jesus says, no man comes to the Father but by me. 
Here's what God said in Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 4. Well, you say Paul wrote that. Yeah, but Paul wrote it the hand of God. Here's what he said. Romans 3, 4, God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. I'm not capable of judging righteous judgment. I'm not capable tonight of judging the heart of any man. I can't even judge my own. I don't even know what's in my heart. I say, Lord, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. And listen to him when he begins to speak to your soul. Talk to you. That's what we've got to do tonight. But you know how important what I just said to you is? I mean, I, I, this, is, this is tough stuff. It's hard stuff. But it's the kind of thing that makes all the difference in the world. God doesn't play with us. And when he gives you revelation like you have tonight from the scripture, you've got the word of God. Do you know what that monster in North Korea does? If you convert to Christianity in North Korea, they'll kill you and your family. Or their extended family. Well, they may decide not to kill you, but to put you in the salt mines or, or you know, wherever Solzhenitsyn was talking about when he came out of Russia. They'll put you somewhere like that. They hate the gospel of Christ. You know why? Why did, the, why, why did Mao and the Chinese communists hate it? Why did Lenin hate the gospel of Christ? Why is it beginning to develop like that in this country? They hate the gospel of Christ. You know why? If the Son make you free... You're free indeed. Once you meet God, everything else is just subservient to it. It's just it's, it's just a lesser essence. Once you meet God, nothing can rise to that level of the Lord God, and they can never make a slave out of you. Amen. They can never do it. They can't do it. And so I choose tonight to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And what's a servant? Greek word is doulos. How many of you know what the word doulos means? I'm sure many of you do. All right? Doulos is translated slave, bond servant. In, some, in other words, I say to the Lord Jesus Christ, you own me. I don't own you. You own me. And because you own me, then I'm in you, and I'm part of you, and I belong to you, and I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. So why in the world should we? Why should we, why should we hem haul around with this culture today? That by the day, now, not by the year, not by, by a decade, by the day, America is rotting from the inside. It's dying, folks, right before your eyes. America is dying exponentially. So what's exponentially mean? When I was a kid, they said, which one would you take, a million dollars or a penny a day? every day and double it. Why? Well, I said, I'll take a million dollars. Who wants a penny? Yeah. You figure that penny a day and double it every day. For the first few weeks, it's not a big deal, but then all of a sudden, it rises to the point to where exponentially it grows in value. And when you're over 30 days, you're well into the millions. Yeah. From a penny. Exponential growth. And this is what's happening in a country. Exponential sin, exponential rot, exponential decay. I told, I told my wife today, I said, all you do now, you're seeing, here you are. Do I need to tell you tonight, flesh is flashing before your face. It's everywhere. They're pushing the limits. Then what, preacher? Well, once they've pushed the limits of seeing, then they start doing. That's next. Get ready for it. The flesh is never satisfied. No. Never. Amen. What's coming next is the doing. All over your TV, all over their parades, they'll march up and down in your towns. What they're going to do to your kids if you let them get away with it, it's the doing that's coming. And this is the only thing that will stop. It's the coming of the Lord. And I say, John, as John did on the Isle of Patmos, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father, bless your word, and thank you for the time we had together tonight. I believe your word. I'm ignorant of much of it. Yes, I need to be taught. 
but I don't reject it because I don't know it. I accept it. Even the part that I don't half understand, I still believe your word. I believe the Bible, and I believe what you've said, and I ask you to bless it now and bless the folk who've heard it. In Jesus' name, amen.